Hi, everybody. My name is Danica Joan, and welcome to Custody Matters Live. I have two wonderful guests with me. I have Tina Mayer, and I have uh, Anne O'Keefe Rogers. Welcome, welcome. Hello. Hi, so, Danica. Tell me, tell me, okay, so first we, we'll um, start with you, Tina. Tell me, or tell us who you are, and, and what do you do? I'm Tina Mayer. I am the founder of the Resolution Center here in Jacksonville, Florida. We have a system in place here at the center to assist families in crisis, um, both in the form of dissolution and those who just need some extra help to get through some tough times. But our main focus is to assist families going through dissolution of marriage or a paternity or custody issues to do so with less conflict and with less harm on the families and the children involved. So we have a variety of services from therapeutic to mediation, a qualified parenting coordination, um, just a, we, we're just here with a plethora of support services, groups, et cetera, to um, assist the families and hopefully keep them out of the courtroom and to uh, bring down the, the heat levels of whatever it is that they're going through. Okay, and I, I've already got several questions for you on that, but I also wanted to give Anne an opportunity to share with our viewers, who are you? Okay, so um, I'm Anne O'Keefe Rogers, and I'm a consultant here at the Resolution Center working side by side with Tina. We do a lot of like connecting of resources, and so being well versed in the area of high conflict families, we get a lot of inquiries, both online and phone calls and whatnot, from high conflict families in need of resources. So here at the Resolution Center, we have support groups, we have peer support specialists, we have a library with a wealth of resources, both the clinical and the research articles on this, so that a parent or a child could come here and soup to nuts, we have everything that they would need to bring that stress level down, to lower the conflict, and to really restore the family. So that's what we do here. Okay, so is this, is, is this resolution center something where a judge would order a family to go to you, or would they come uh, on their own volition? Both, both. Um, I do a lot of social investigation and guardian ad litem work. I am a therapist and a qualified parenting coordinator and a mediator. So I can get court ordered appointments for those particular services. What we're trying to do, um, and you are such a, a proponent of all this, is educate the judges to what the services can do as a combined unit. And I would love to be able to have a family court ordered to come through our, our system as opposed to one particular service, but also families who can who just know that this is the kind of thing that they would like to do is go through a, a system and stay out of the courtroom and not litigate. They can come here and start to finish for a dissolution or a custody matter. Um, they can get all the help that they need and the support that they need that we can craft the agreements that they need to have and we can submit those to the court. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a, what a difference. It's no longer a com combative, uh, winner takes all kind of battle. They can actually come into right. like a multidisciplinary center that uh, that that helps them where they need. So when I understand you have like support groups for mm -hmm. people, uh, you have mental health, you have mediation and uh, parent coordination, um, all in one spot. Now, yes. is it something you do it? You have a physical location, or is it? Do you have uh, virtual groups with that? We have a physical location. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not as well versed in the virtual end of it. That's more of an and question, but um, we, if it's a physical location, you can come in here and meet face-to-face -face with people. So okay. what, what Tina has created is something really amazing, Danica. So totally compliant with all of the restrictions that we have because of the pandemic with COVID-19, this place is completely sanitized from top to bottom, so that should a client need services that are face-to-face, -face, we have not only met all the compliance restrictions and all the compliance measures, the client feels at home. You walk in the door, um, 
everything from all the details have been thought of as far as the, the noise levels, um, there's a water feature, the soothing colors. It's as close to like being on the beach and doing therapy as you can get, even though we're not on the beach doing therapy. So what, what Tina's really put together is kind of an oasis. The world out there is so high conflict right now. When we have our governor and our mayor saying that the incidence of violence, domestic violence are going up, up, up. Child abuse is going up, up, up. You can come here. I mean, we have a child therapy playroom with all kinds of toys. We have stuff that's appropriate for teens. We have a wealth of resources for adults. So it's really, it's really kind of amazing how all these myriad resources are here all in one place. Mm, that's awesome. It's something I don't know that we have, have it in our area that I know of, uh, a center like that. I mean, we have, uh, we have a mental health center that's pretty big here in Central Florida, but, um, but it doesn't, definitely doesn't address these high conflict custody situations. And um, something before we started, went, before we went on the air, we were talking about that, what would make the difference with um, you know, the decisions that the judges make. Um, I mean, it sounds to me like up in Jacksonville, Florida, you, there's this beautiful place for judges to, that know that this is a high conflict family they can send them to. Um, and yet I think about, what about my circuit? We have one of our staff members, um, Annie Gordon does early childhood education because all parents now are their teachers at home. We have resources there to be able to help parents um, get help their child complete all the requirements that are necessary um, for graduation, for promotion to the next level, et cetera. So we have that availability and we have those resources too because um, all the students are now home. They're being, all being homeschooled. And so we have resources there too. Yeah, I, you know, I just, it, it's just in a few days, it's Mother's Day. And uh, one of the things that I know we missed our normal Wednesday night uh, Custody Matters Live um, and that's why we're doing it today because it is so, so important that we don't skip over the, an opportunity to talk about something that impacts uh, families, which is Mother's Day. Um, Mother's Day on one end, you can be a marginalized mom like I had been, and Mother's Day is probably like the, the, the most depressing day of the year. Um, and it also has an impact on dads too. Um, you know, one thing that I really pride myself in this show it being is it's, it's, there is no gender bias here. We get that marginalized parents come in different genders and alienating parents also come in, in genders. Um, I remember, you know, I, I found sometimes people are kind of insensitive to that. I, I was actually at a church service one Mother's Day, and I had been going through the worst of the worst of my high conflict custody situation. And I went to church where, you know, Mother's Day, they're supposed to be speaking light into mothers in the congregation. And the pastor talked about the statistics of um, a, the, the outcomes for children who have no dads in their lives. And I was just like, talk about, put, it, put a knife in me. Um, because for a, for a woman who I, you know, named my nonprofit, Kids Need Both, like I get the importance of children having a relationship with both parents, that it, I thought that was very inappropriate for Mother's Day. So are there anything, anything that you can contribute to kind of be a light to some of our, um, our viewers, um, the moms and the dads, uh, with this upcoming holiday? I would like to say that having worked with um, families for reunification, the, the not giving up, and, and yes, these are things that are hard uh, that you're going through, and I, the depth of pain that you feel on those particular days is, is unfathomable because everything that you're going through just is a reminder, <laughs> like this is happening to me, this is happening to me. But I also want to just give 
give a positive note that if, if you can stick that out, find friends, find resources, take time for yourself, go celebrate that day. Even if it's on your own or with a friend, celebrate it um, because you, you are a parent. Even if you're not being with your child, celebrate that day, celebrate yourself for being strong, for being resilient. Um, take some time and do some things that you like, but also keep that hope alive because I was, well, I'm working with parents on the reunification end and I've had enough success that I know that it can be turned around, that it can be changed, and that the next Mother's Day or Father's Day could be different for you. And you just have to keep walking and keep keep that positive focus. But don't ignore that it hurts. You know, don't ignore it, nurse it, nurture it, and acknowledge it. But don't let it get you to the place where you feel like you have no hope. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's the truth. Yeah. You know, um, lately, and one, one of the reasons that we didn't have our show last night was because I was, to be honest, I was in a breakdown around um, my adult child who's trying to grapple with what, what, hap what happened. Um, you know, so it is painful. It's just when you think you're healed, um, then this stuff comes up where they're trying to, to, to sort out uh, the pain of their past. And then of course, as a mom, it like to watch them share their stories of what they went, went through from their perspective. It's like a, just a knife in your heart for sure. And for those of us who are, are biological mothers to know that that child lived six inches from your heart at one time for nine months, six inches from your heart. And so that child has half you and half dad. And the, for alienated kiddos who are not able to love both parents on Mother's Day or Father's Day, because we're going to be going through the same thing next month on Father's Day, mm -hmm. those, it, it's really important, I think, for alienated parents to try to put themselves in their kiddos' shoes and try to realize when you're not allowed to love the other parent, be it mom or dad, you're, you're really, you're really in, you're almost like in a prison. You're almost in chains. You're not allowed to love the other half of you. And it's really important for alienated parents who are in so much pain to try to step outside of themselves and try to see things from their child's perspective. Yeah, you know, um, I know back in the day in preschool, you know how like in preschool and kindergarten, um, the school, the teachers make sure that the child makes a Mother's Day something or another for their, for the parents. And I was, I was, uh, you know, those Mother's Day gifts got taken away and given to grandma. And, um, but I just, I just, you know, I, I never, ever let my kids know, um, that how painful that was. And, um, and I know it hurt the teacher because I know the teacher found out and then over the last, over the next couple of weeks, the teacher wanted me, wanted uh, my child to recreate a Mother's Day gift for me. So it really, it has, it, it's something where there's a lot of people who are um, trying to create a safe space for our children who know that, especially if they are very privy to the high conflict situation, um, there's, that's all the more reason to stay in communication with those teachers and realize that they're not and there may be a time when they're actually aligned with or an un, uh, unintentional accomplice of an alienator. That, um, but you gotta understand that um, all you have to do is just be loving to them, to those teachers and uh, the, all the different other people in, in uh, your child's life. And I would encourage people to not, um give in to that feeling of, I don't want people to know this because it's, it might reflect poorly on me or they might have the wrong belief about me. We need to speak truth into the world because this is such a hidden thing um, that people who have never been through it, they, they don't realize how many people they actually know who are probably encountering alienation on some level or, um, enduring the conflict of the court and the, and the trauma of the court 
unless they have actually experienced it or know someone who has, because it's not talked about. It's not something that's brought out into the open. And so having these forums gives people a voice, which also can help you process it out and, and deal with it better because you aren't just silently sitting in a corner suffering on your own. You can be out there and, and connecting with people who are going through something similar or who can give you the support that you need on those times when it's, when it's difficult. You know, I was thinking, we were talking earlier about what, what could make a difference and we were sort of, um, something that came to my mind is that adult child, adult survivors of childhood abuse or, and parental alienation is uh, abuse, they, by the time they start grappling with it in their 20s, approaching their 30s, they're trying to um, make sense of it all. They already spent so many years of their childhood in such pain and you know, denying themselves that when they start sorting it out, the last thing they want to do is be an advocate. And I think that if you are, any of our viewers out there are adult children of childhood parental alienation, please reach out to us, speak to us, because this is what the judges need to hear. They need to know the outcome, the impact on you and what would have made a difference. Uh, a lot of times you don't have a choice in the matter. Don't have a choice in the matter who the parents are that, and, and the way that your parents are behaving, but maybe there's something that the judge could have done. I know children have a tendency to, be, to keep abuse to themselves, keep it hidden. And then the, the professionals that, because there's no bruiser, bruises or anything like that, all of the abuse is psychological and emotional and it's hidden. Even the professionals may feel like that they can't, take any, they, they can't do anything about it to fix it. Uh, so. well, one of, can I, I want to speak to that for a second because one of the things, and it's more so with the level of reunification or when you're identifying cases that might have alienation with them, is because traditional methods of therapy aren't really helpful in these types of situations because there is such a level of denial. And, and traditional therapy is based on the premise that we believe our, our clients. Like if, if you're sitting on my couch and you're telling me a story, my first job is to believe you and not um, contradict or I'm, I might question a few things but you, you don't dig past where your client wants to go. Whereas in an alienation case, you kind of have to come at it from a different point of view that the things that you're hearing may not be what they're actually feeling and, and how you uncover those things and how you process those things out has to be a little bit different than what traditional therapy usually offers. And so a lot of mental health professionals could be dealing with an alienated child and not even realize it when they're hearing about the trauma that their other parent might have inflicted upon them or something along those lines. And so there's going to be a, even a longer process for these children because if they're going to a therapist who supports the alienation point of view, then it takes them even longer to kind of recover from that because they're also going, but all of these people told me that this was the right thing, that they agreed with me in these in these moments and, and what was happening to me. So there has to be a, a lot more education also in that in that field in order to help the children and the adults in that situation how to come out of it with a little stronger point of view or or to feel guiltless in that. And that's probably the biggest part is to is to removing of the guilt and shame that a child especially may feel for having gone along with everything for so long. And they identify with their abusers. I mean, it's, it's very much like a, you know, a, being a prisoner of war and they become bonded with their captor. Uh, and it, and when, it, when their captor is their parent, um, it's even more of a reason to bond with them uh, for dysfunctional reasons. Um, it's yeah. a survival instinct. It's a survival instinct. To, to, I would, you yeah, have to go along with that. Absolutely, isn't that what children do? I mean, children, 
<laughs> children will, they're the quickest to throw, throw somebody under the bus to save themselves, you know, uh, in, in school or, you know, whatever. I'm just talking normal childhood ways of being. Um, it's I'm, counterintuitive though. It's, as far as the counterintuitive nature of it to an outsider, whether you're a school counselor or a teacher or a doctor or any other outside part of the, the family unit, you're looking mm -hmm. at, boy, this parent does mm -hmm. seem like he's got it all together mm -hmm. and she's whatever, or, or vice versa. She's got it all together and he's the, the whatever. So it's the opposite of whatever it would seem. And like mm -hmm. Tina's talking about, it takes a counselor who's got that level of insight and maybe to be able to say, let's take a step back and really see the whole picture. Is it possible that these behaviors really mean something else? Yeah. You know, that's, that's where it takes somebody who's got that, that extra, that little extra edge of knowledge. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, children will protect their abusers and, um, you know, there's just a lot of things that, that just kind of, I found myself through my journey over the last, last 20 years, I found myself having to educate the professionals that supposed, we're supposed to know. Um, the other thing that I did was, uh, one, the other thing that came to me was the gatekeepers. They're, every gatekeeper should, needs to have this education on what to look for. Like, uh, I, I was just looking through my documents, my, you know, um, and I ran across trying to make a police report because there was such a barrage of false allegations that were um, waged on me uh, that they took the reports and it like on a weekly basis, uh, a new, um, it's like they probably knew, oh, it's Sunday night. They're going to, this family's going to come in. Um, so when I... I saw something that needed to needed the attention of, of the police. When I went, they refused to take the report on the basis. There's been too many reports on this family. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm the first time I came into these doors to file a concern about the safety of these children. Um, and now you're, you're stonewalling me. And um, I mean, that's those gatekeepers that failed my children. They failed my children because they didn't have the, the education to know, wait a minute, this person's never walked into these doors and now she is. I mean, you know, it's, and I totally get that a lot of times it becomes like these, these child service reports, it becomes more of a, of a, of a tool of retaliation. I'm going to call, I'm going to call, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, the other part of that is that um, if you if you look at how the court system is set up, it's a it's a two dimensional system of evidence. So if you have one DCF report or two DCF reports, a judge could look at that and go, oh well, th these could be false if they were put aside. But the more you stack them up then there's this giant file. And the more reports there are, then the more it seems like, well, there must be something there. Where there's smoke, there must be fire. And that's also that counterintuitive um, component because the filing of reports, so they're gonna look at what your, your name pops up and there's report after report after report against you, then it does seem like you're just coming in to file something in retaliation and that that you are absolutely correct that system has to has to be um, revamped with education but that's going to take a little bit of time but it is one of the tools that I look for uh, when I'm doing investigations because if I see a lot of dismissed DCF reports and a lot of um, filed police reports that had no foundings and there was no arrests and no reason for any further investigation, that to me is an indicator where other an attorney might take that as, well, they're just not doing their job. They're not following through. But from my point of view, knowing how alienation works, 
that is an indicator that there is probably something I need to look a little more closely at where most mental health professionals or other people are not trained to look at it that from that perspective. Yeah, I agree. And uh, that takes some sort of quantitative, just creating some sort of, uh, you know, distinctions, checklists and, and things to pay attention to and to train these people to know what to look for. And I, I know with, um, you know, DCF, when there is a call, there has to be so uh, the worker, the caseworker has to go and check in on it. And I get that they're so bombarded with so many case uh, cases that it's like they can't possibly be effective in doing their job, and much less, I mean, in, um, you know, constantly, you know, having to, to get them trained, get them up to speed, because DCF, you know, the caseworkers are not just dealing with potential parental alienation they're dealing with you know sexual molestation child neglect like with a, actual yeah. abuse cases <laughs> yeah yeah right um yeah and those kids a lot of those kids there's actual physical evidence that and they're and they've already been you know taken from that family and i'm certainly not advocating them you know that happening to a high conflict family situation, but they, if they're educated, they could definitely be the, um, you know, the canary in the cage that notifies them that this could be a parental alienation situation. Well, part of what needs to happen is just a change in the system with regard to, and I'm, I'm not promoting the resolution center in and of itself, but just a change of the system to something similar where all of the professionals involved in a case are, are speaking to each other, where there isn't this uh, one therapist over on this side of town and then mom goes to another therapist over here and the kids go somewhere else and then there might be some other uh, person involved, a pediatrician. But if the alienator can tell different stories to all of those different people, the teachers and whoever, and, but nobody's talking to each other, the inconsistencies never come out. And it, so when people are all working together under one roof or at least connected in some way where they can communicate with each other in a family court case, and it's not two attorneys trying to keep evidence out of something because the rules of evidence are, are just like a criminal case. So you might have something that's very significant, but somebody didn't file it properly, and so therefore it's not admissible. Well, these are people's lives. This is, not, I'm not trying to prove a bank robbery here or who slashed somebody's tires. So the disconnection of that and the ability for um, maybe a DCF worker to contact the court and say, is there a court case coming on us? We need to, to be connected and talk to all the players. There's too much uh, separation of all of the different players, and so, once that starts coming together, and that's how guardian ad litems tend to be helpful is because you can talk to everybody and you should talk to everybody, you start connecting the dots. And then that's when the alienation signs really start to show up. Well, why did the teacher think this, but the therapist thought this, but this was the same, same incident or same thing that was going on? Or you can find the patterns of lies or the patterns of um, disconnect there. And so that's where you're going to stop that kind of thing from happening where continuous false allegations continue to go through because you might get three different DCF workers. You might get five different police officers. <laughs> Whereas if everybody had some point of connection and somebody to report things to, like a center or a singular person, then all of those slipping through the cracks and we can catch the alienation earlier on or the attempts at it, it can be mitigated instead of three years down the road and you're still fighting it out in court and nobody's really catching on. Yeah, you, you would think, I like the, the collaborative approach. I do like that there is, um, and in, in some ways, dependency court is designed where it's yes. you know, collaborative. However, I, I use that as an example of how family court should be. However, I know that the dependency court is very dysfunctional and ineffective. I get it. Um, my thing is that there's, in dependency court, you really have to, to get a TPR or a termination of parent, parental rights, that 
other parent had to have totally dropped the ball for one thing, um, not just proved guilty of abuse or neglect, but didn't even go through the therapies to, to correct that behavior. And it takes a couple of years to get a TPR. Now in family court, all they have to be, all they have to have is a really aggressive attorney um, for base, essentially that other parent to have a TPR. And, um, and I find it, I find it's like a winner takes all kind of system where the big loser is the child. Absolutely. You know, um, we were kind of talking about brainstorming about what would make a difference. What would have made a difference for my adult children who uh, are now dealing with the impact of a childhood, an upbringing of this, where all the gatekeepers, all of the people in their lives, none of them were able to get them out of it. Um, they just had to, it just, you know, grow out of it, so to speak. Now, uh, and I, I've got to believe in our county, in our circuit, that there were people who really, really wanted to make the difference. But you can't, you can't rely on a little child to break solidarity with, you know, their par the, the parent that's, you know, keeping them from telling, telling the truth. You can't, you can't rely on that. Um, and unfortunately in the system, you can't, you can't make somebody guilty of something you have no evidence of. Um, you know, so there's, and, and that's, I think that's why it is that I'm such a stand for equal shared parenting to be the first go-to where both parents are equally responsible for making, for taking care of their kids, you know, like equal split time. Um, and it's like the child suddenly is no longer trapped like a prisoner in one person's household and stuff like you know they they're actually over here and over here and if one side is a, is is toxic it starts showing itself because they start feeling like well i have safety i do have a place where there is safety and it shows up and i um so i don't i know it's a simplistic way of um you know solution but it's certainly a start and i think a lot of the judges are all about uh, they keep hinging on i don't care what the right you know about parents rights i care about the child's rights and the what's best interest for the child and i get that but i don't think that they really get that um they've got 15 minutes to decide who's the better parent and do they really want to make a bad decision based upon the fact that one seems to have it all together, but they're actually the alienator and you have the other one that's a hot mess because they're dealing, they're, they're actually experiencing PTSD. So. And that is the, that is what needs to change that there needs to be a more cohesive system where people are working collaboratively and together and not, two opposing attorneys trying to duke it out. The litigation uh, methodology does not work at all. And so if you could go get people through a system where they have to kind of run a gauntlet and you can start sifting through where the problems are, if there's going to be an alien, some, there are definitely personality disorders at work here in the higher conflict ones. I've never had one case where I didn't find some level of that. And so that's not necessarily curable, but it has to be taken into consideration that there are going to be effects on the kids at the end of the day. And if we can filter, filter through them through a little bit better and then give them a more peaceful transition into life after divorce or life after a paternity uh, custody issue, then the kids are going to be in a safer place, even if they're with one parent more, but it, it will identify the parent that is going to be the most cooperative about inviting the other parent in. Because if, they, if the one with the most power is the one who says, nope, you're not coming in, I'm going to do everything I can to keep you out, 
then that's the, that's the parent who is going to create the alienation. And if the other parent is more conducive to saying, I'm, I understand even though you don't like me very much, um, that you are still a parent and you have, have a, a right to the relationship, your, your, the children have a right to a relationship with you, that's the parent that should have the most time, the most power, and I hate to use the word power in that because it should be a shared thing, but if control is given to the person who's going to abuse it, that's when children are in the most danger. Absolutely. You know, and they, and um, it's just, you know, it's just not healthy. I, as they get older, uh, when you've got an unhealthy parent that's totally in control of the time of the child and stuff like that, the, 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 that codependent bond that that child makes with that parent goes well into adulthood. And, um, it, you know, so they're not balanced in right. um, their upbringing and, of course, in their future relationships, um, you know, don't stand a chance, it seems, you know, statistically. Well, uh, we've come to the end of our, our show. I thank you so much for the conversation, Tina. You've been very helpful. And um, what I get from it is we need more resolution centers. Um, Great. Let's, I, I, I'll do the model. You guys take it worldwide and we'll get rid of all of this all together. That would be the, that's my dream. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? I would love to, I'd love to partner you with it, with you on that. All right. Well, that's all we have here for Custody Matters Live. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you again next week.